Uh, thanks for, for coming to today's event. It's a real privilege to not only share today with you, but to share it with Mary Beth Tinker. Before we start, a few special thanks to uh, people who made this event possible. Stanley Bondi, thanks for setting it up as always. Audrey, my assistant, thank you for everything on this one. Elena, who's running around, was very in instrumental. My, my RA and Mike um, Highstand from the Student Press Law Center in Washington, who's bringing the Tinker Tour right to Syracuse. So I'd like to start off and challenge you guys to think back to when you were in middle school and what you were doing in middle school. Some of you, it wasn't that long ago. For others, it was a long time ago. But let me tell you what Mary Beth Tinker was doing when she was in middle school. She was protesting the Vietnam War. And she did so by wearing a black armband to school. And that protest earned her the right to get kicked out of school. And ultimately, Mary Beth brought her fight and her protest all the way to the United States Supreme Court, basing her argument on free speech and First Amendment values. And the case, Tinker versus Des Moines, which many of you will read in Com Law, or may have already read in your, your other endeavors, uh, you know that Tinker v. Des Moines from 1969 stands for the, the, the premise that students don't shed their First Amendment right, rights at the schoolhouse gate. And it's a very important doctrine that may or may not be uh, adhered to in many of American schools. But um, Mary Beth has been fighting for First Amendment and free speech rights and children's rights ever since. And she's taking her advocacy on tour across the country with the Tinker Tour. And we're lucky that she decided to bring the Tinker Tour right to us. So join me in welcoming Mary Beth Tinker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gutterman and the Tully Center. So wonderful. What a good program. You're so lucky to have that here. All right. Good job. Wow, it's really good. Yes, well, we're, we're traveling all over the United States, uh, Mike and I, in a 29-foot RV called Gabby. We named it. Uh, it's called Gabby because it's about the First Amendment. And so we want to encourage students and encourage young people to stand up and speak up and make a difference, make the world better through their First Amendment rights, through your First Amendment rights. And I've been working as a nurse, mostly in pediatrics, for the last 25 years or so. But after a while, I got kind of tired of seeing how young people are the recipients of policies that they had no part in making. That's not really democracy. And so I'd be taking care of you know, a little child that was maybe seven or eight years old who had been burned in a house fire. And my job was to take off all their bandages and you know, give them some IV narcotics or something, and then dip this screaming kid into a bath of Whirlpool bath, take them out, wrap them back up again with their bandages and their salve and everything, and then I came to find out that actually the leading cause of house fires where I was living there in St. Louis was, um, I mean the leading cause of, of burns in children was house fires. So I started slowly just feeling that kids, young people, teenagers should have some say, should have a voice, should have a part to play in the policies that govern their lives. And it goes for teenagers, and it goes for college students, and it goes for young adults as well. Now, recently, I've been working at a hospital, Prince George's Hospital, outside of Washington, D.C., where I live. And mostly I work with um, adolescent trauma patients up to age 25. So every day, you know, I'll go into work and I'll see some uh, kid that's been shot, and maybe they have a chest tube with, you know, blood dripping out of it, and they'll have tattoos and everything. And when I ask, well, what's that tattoo on your neck? A lot of times they'll say, oh, that's my grandmother, or, you know, that's Rose, that's my mother, or it's a RIP, rest in peace, that's my cousin who was shot and killed. And so, again, 
I started thinking more and more that I need to encourage these kids to, to use their own voices, to stand up, to make a difference for their interests, to stand up for um, safer neighborhoods, for safer communities. And so that's what I've been doing more and more. And so we're going around the country now on our Tinker Tour, and we're speaking with uh, children and teenagers and, and students, and we're going to a juvenile detention center to to speak to those kids too, because we have so many kids that are being locked up now after they get suspended for um, maybe, you know, a shoe wearing a shoestring of the wrong color or some minor infraction like that. The kids get suspended and then the next thing you know they're expelled and the next thing you know they're in the juvenile detention center and then they're into the school to prison pipeline, which is a name that has been, um, you know, used to describe what is going on now in the United States, especially for low-income children and children of color, where their rights are being severely curtailed, even more than other kids, and they are being channeled into a life in the criminal justice system, which begins now when they're even in second and third and fourth grade. And I decided that I need to speak up about that. But more than that, I need to encourage kids to speak up for themselves and to use their own voices for that. And so many of them are all over the country. There are second and third graders in Washington, D.C., where I live. And there are junior high students. A nine-year-old in Chicago just led a march against school closings, public school closings. And his name was Ashan. And he, he gave this speech to Arne Duncan, the director of education for the United States. You know, he's, he's the head of the Department of Education. He said, Arne Duncan, you can see photos of him online. He's holding this microphone. He's nine years old. And he's saying, Arne Duncan, you should stand up for schools. You should not be closing schools. You should be supporting our schools. And these are the voices of children, the voices of teenagers. So I want to hear more of them, and we need to hear more of them, because young people are especially geared to taking our world forward, to, to making our democracy grow, and to, and to making things better. And young people have been doing this all through history. I love to tell kids stories of a homeless teenage runaway who was um, in the 1700s. He was living in, in Boston. And he was a printer, speaking of journalism. He started writing these really good articles that were very popular. And some of them were about how we should have our own ideas. We should have our own thoughts. We should have freedom of thought in our country. And so eventually he ran away from his brother's um, printing shop where he was an indentured servant there. And this homeless teenage runaway went off to Philadelphia where he became one of the leaders in the American Revolution. Anyone know who this, who this bad boy was? Huh? Who? Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin. And, you know, you could keep going through history, and there are so many other young people, because young people really helped to build our country. Young people have worked in the factories. Young people have worked in the farms and plantations. Young people have fought in every war. And, and you know, we could go up to the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement. When I was growing up, in the early 1960s, I was growing up and it seemed like everyone around me was a strong, brave person. My father was a preacher at the Methodist church next door. And he would stand up at a pulpit like this and he would talk about God's love and brotherhood. And then during the week, he put those ideas into action. Because the swimming pool up the street in this little small town where we lived, Atlantic, Iowa. It wouldn't allow black kids to swim there. So he took some of the kids from the church and he went up to the swimming pool and he was gonna speak up and stand up for what was right and for his Christian values and his, his democratic values. And he spoke up and he tried to change that. But it didn't always go over so well. Um, as I found out in life, when you stand up and speak up, you don't always win. So he didn't win either, and we had to move from that town as a result of what he did. We had to move to Des Moines, Iowa. Well, there my father continued to speak up for his values, and my mother also was a strong, brave person, and she would go down to the poor part of town, and she, she worked there. She was a psychologist, and she came home and would tell us about the, the cribs for the babies that 
there was a baby sleeping in this crib and a rat ran across the baby and the mother had been so upset. And my mom came home and told us this story about how she was gonna speak up about that and she was gonna go down to City Hall and she was gonna um, stand up about that and that there should be more rat control in these neighborhoods and that, that's not right, that's not fair, that's not democracy and it's not Christian values. So the, those were the kinds of people that I was raised by. And then there was my big sister, Bonnie. She was also a strong person who stood up for what she believed in. And she, she wrote an essay called What the Emancipation Proclamation Means to Me. And this was in 1963. And, and she spoke up and said, yes, you know, it's wonderful. The slaves were freed in 1863. We're in the 100th anniversary. But we have to do more. And we have to speak up against discrimination. And we have to speak up. Well, she won the NAACP essay contest that year. And it was the same year that, that my family was named the NAACP Family of the Year, in fact, because of all the ways that my parents were speaking up and using their First Amendment rights. Only problem was, it wasn't always so popular. So my dad was put out of another church. He lost his, his church in Des Moines also. And he was asked to leave that church. I was about 10 years old by then. It was about 1962 or so. So when he left. So by this time, I was starting to wonder about church. I was kind of getting a little skeptical about the whole idea of church um, because we had to move. We had to leave our house. We had to leave. I left my school. We moved across town, and we lived in a, in a small house then, and I had to start a whole a brand new school where I was scared because I was a shy person. Yes, I was raised by all of these brave, strong people, and I was surrounded by people like that, but I wasn't like that. There was me. I was a shy person. I was very thin, and, and my mom's friend Edna always used to say that I was going to blow away. I was so thin. Well, I would, when they went up to uh, picket, my mom and her friend Edna would go up to the local drugstore to picket, and they would carry these signs, and sometimes we would go with them, and they would sing songs like, I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. And they would sing these great songs, and we shall overcome. And they would take us up with them. We slowly started getting the idea, you know, this is a way of life. This is the way that you should live your life, to speak up for something, for equality and for our democracy. Well... By 1963, that was a huge year in the United States for um, equality and democracy, 50 years ago. And we're selling, celebrating that year, all, all year this year, because so much happened that year. There was this, the um, Birmingham Children's Crusade that year. Speaking of children making a difference and taking our world forward, Martin Luther King was in Birmingham that year and his campaign was trying to fill up the jails in Birmingham, which was the most segregated town in America then. Because the kids, no one could, the blacks could not go into the store. They could not um, go to school at a good school. There was segregated schooling. And if they dared to stand up and register to vote, there, were, there was a good chance they could be lynched and killed. So that year, Martin Luther King was in jail writing his famous letter from Birmingham jail and he was telling the church leaders that they had been saying that you know they should wait and be we should wait and be patient for equality but he said no there the time for standing up for equality is now it is always now and he wrote this very strong letter from Birmingham jail and the children in Birmingham decided to take up the cause so almost 2,000 children were arrested that year in Birmingham, Alabama. Teenagers, kids as, as young as seven and eight years old, went out in the streets. And they organized at the 16th Avenue Baptist Church, which was their headquarters. And they marched out of the church in these columns of 50 kids per, per group. And every group would be arrested. A new group would be arrested. And the chief of police said, when is this going to stop? And the kids said, when we have equality, it's going to stop. But they just kept coming, they kept coming. They had to start these outdoor prisons to build these outdoor places for all the kids because there were so many. At the end of the campaign, which ended the first part of May, 50 years ago, Martin Luther King said that it was a turning point for the civil rights movement. Because after that, all of America had eyes on 
the civil rights movement, had eyes on the South, had eyes on these children, and eyes on this inequality, which our country had tolerated until that point. Up in Iowa, I was watching this on TV from the living room with my little sister, Hope, who was in fifth grade, and my, and my little brother, Paul. And we thought it was pretty amazing to see these kids who were attacked by water hoses, who were attacked by German shepherds. And again, we started getting the idea that that, that, was, that was something to stand up for, that, that that was an example of a way to live. The next summer, my parents were called to Mississippi for Freedom Summer. They didn't know they were going to be going down to Mississippi that summer. I was 12 years old. I had just turned 12. And my parents, um, there were, there were a group of college students. Again, the power of young people to make a difference. There were a group of college students from all over the country that were called to Mississippi that year by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Their leader was Robert Moses. And he said, you know, all these uh, young people and civil rights workers are getting killed and lynched in the South. What we should do is have college students come from all over the country to be here with us, to stand up for us. And so he put out a call, and these college students trained in Western College for Women in Ohio. And you can read their letters. They wrote home to their parents, you know, these experiences that they had in the training where they had to sit in a chair and pretend like they were at a lunch counter and have someone spit on them and have someone dump hot coffee on them and have someone threaten to kill them so that they'd be ready for what they were going to face when they got down to Mississippi. As soon as they got to Mississippi, the first group took buses and went down there. And as soon as they got there, three of them were killed. Their names were Cheney, Schwarner, and Goodman. Cheney was black, and the other two were white. One had, they had both been college students. And they, a call went out all over the United States then. People, please come to Mississippi so these young people are not killed this summer. And my parents went there. When they got there, they found a situation that they had never experienced before that they could hardly imagine. They came home and told us kids about it when they came home. And they told us about how they had been staying with an older lady out in the country, an older black lady there in Ruleville, Mississippi, where Fannie Lou Hamer lived. And that night, the woman said, now, tonight, I want you to sleep in the back room. Because when the shooting starts, you'll be safe in the back. And so my parents were very worried and upset, and they said, is he shooting? And she said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm used to it. It's OK. I'll be in the front here, and you go in the back. You'll be safe back there. So they went to the back, and of course, they could barely sleep. And in the middle of the night, they heard the shots. They heard the shooting start. They ran up to the front where the lady was crouched, this older lady there by the windowsill, looking out in the dark night in Mississippi, in Ruleville, Mississippi. And out on the road was a pickup truck shooting at her house and at her dog. And so my parents rushed over there and they said, you know, quick, quick, let's call the sheriff. We've got to call the sheriff. And she said, honey, that is the sheriff. That was the sheriff on her road shooting her house because she was involved with the voting campaign there in, in Mississippi for Freedom Summer, 1964. And maybe that explains why there was something like 7% of African Americans in Mississippi that were registered to vote that year. But when my parents came home and told us stories like that, and how they had to crouch in the floor of the station wagon they were riding in so that they wouldn't be shot and killed like the three college students had been, we started to really feel that this was an example, that this was a way of life, that this is a, a life worth living. Even though we were scared, I was still a young kid, and I was, I was very shy and scared. And I still felt that there was something that other people do. This is something other people do. But I started to have it ingrained in me that this is, this is the way of life. And so the next year, when the Vietnam War was building up, there had been about 1,000 US soldiers killed by then. I was watching it again on TV. And as a young student told me this summer when I was speaking to some middle school kids in Washington, D.C., she said, 
Yeah, we watch all these things go by on the news, and we don't know what we can do about it. And sometimes we feel really sad, but we don't know what to do about it. And I could understand so well what she was saying, because I felt so much like that when I was a kid in 1965. I was watching it all on the news, and I didn't know what to do about it. But I would watch things like the huts on fire in Vietnam, and the burning. It seemed like the whole world was on fire when we watched the news. Um, the body bags lying on the ground with soldiers. And every night, Walter Cronkite would have a body count on the news. And we would hear, you know, tonight's dead body count is 17 soldiers killed in Vietnam. And the next night, there were eight soldiers killed in Vietnam today. And every night, we would hear these kinds of things. And we were so upset, and it was very emotional. And I'm going to have Mike talk later about his experience as a child during the Vietnam War because it was very different. But for me, growing up, I saw this on the news. I knew there were kids in our neighborhood, teenagers, that were being called to the war in the draft. But mostly, I experienced it as something very far away, but that was affecting me anyway in a very emotional way. By this time, my, my father worked for the Quakers because he had been put out of his other church also. So by this time, we were going to Quaker meeting on Sundays, and of course, that was all about peace, and you know they're pacifists, so we learned even more about peace there, and my father worked for the, for the Quakers as well. So again, it was a value that was instilled in us. But that year, some young people including my brother John and some of his friends, decided that they should wear um, black armbands to school. That this could be a way to express their feelings about the war also. And Robert Kennedy, it was Christmas time, and Robert Kennedy was calling for a truce in the war that Christmas. And kids are so logical. That's what I love about kids, too, because there should be um, a chance for kids to speak up because they can really contribute. And kids, you know, as kids, we just thought this was such a great idea, a truce at Christmas, of course. Christmas is about peace. It's about love. We should stop the fighting at Christmas. And so, of course, we thought it was a good idea to just wear an armband like this to show that we were sad. It's a symbol that goes back through history. And when the soldiers were killed, a lot of times their families would wear black armbands. We had also seen black armbands before in 1963 because when the Birmingham children, after the, the march on Washington that year, when everyone went home, after Martin Luther King gave his great speech, I have a dream speech, everyone went home. Back in Birmingham that year, there was a bombing at the Birmingham, um, at the headquarters of the children's, the, at their church, the 16th Avenue Church. And there were four little girls who were killed there. Their charred bodies were found in the stairway of the church. And those kids were about the same age as my sisters and I. And we all went to a memorial service there in, in Des Moines when they were killed. And some people were wearing black armaments to that memorial service. So by the time 1965 came around, when this idea came up to wear black armbands, there was a lot in life that I felt sad about. And I decided that I would do it too, that I should, have, that I should express my feelings about this and take a stand also. I had so many examples in my life by then of people who did take a stand. So I just decided I was going to join with the older kids and do that. But the problem was, two days before we were supposed to um, wear our armbands, the principals made a ruling against armbands. And so it came in, out in the Des Moines Register, which is where we heard it first, in the newspaper, our morning paper. My brother delivered papers then. And sometimes I would go and help him throw them on the steps of the houses. But it was on the front page of the Des Moines Register that armbands were banned in schools. So that was a huge dilemma because I was this little good preacher's girl. I didn't get in trouble. I didn't break rules. I went skating on the weekends with Connie. I went to slumber parties. I wasn't some big rabble rouser rule breaker. But in the end, I decided that I should do it and that I would be willing if if the consequence was to be suspended, I would be willing to be suspended to stand up for my feelings about, about war. 
And so I went off to school that morning and we put on these armbands. Well, my little sister Hope and Paul and I did because John decided to wait till the next day to try to negotiate with the school board. But Hope and Paul, my little brother and sister, they said, we want peace, we want peace too. So they wore armbands to school too. And when I was walking to school with Connie, my friend, I was really scared. And when I got to school, some of the kids started teasing me. And then at lunchtime, uh, the boys' table always sat next to us, girls' table. Of course, we sat at our own table. And so the boys started saying, I want an armband for Christmas. I want an armband. So they were just teasing me, but I ignored them like I always did. And so then later, after lunch, I went off to my math class, which was where Mr. Moberly was my teacher, and he was my favorite teacher. And Mr. Moberly was standing at the door of the math class with a pink slip in his hand. And I knew that was a bad sign. That means you have to go to the office. So when I got up there, he said, yes, you have to go to the office, Mary Beth. Mary Beth you're not supposed to be wearing those armbands. I took the pink slip. I went down to Miss Tanner in the office. I was very nervous and scared. I was 13. I was in eighth grade. I had on my armband. I was trying to make a stand and, and express my beliefs as I had so many examples for in my life. And when I got down to the office, Mrs. Tanner said, Mary Beth, I'm surprised at you. You know that's against the rules, so take off the armband right now. So in a great stand of courage and conviction, I said, okay, Mrs. Tanner, here you go, take it off, all right. And I said, oh boy, that's over to myself. And I went back to my math class and I was called back to the office and I was suspended anyway. Over at Roosevelt High School, Chris Eckhart was also wearing his armband, and he was being hassled quite a bit by the, some of the students and by the assistant principal who was asking him if he wanted a busted nose. Well, the principal later said in court that he wasn't threatening Chris, he was just asking him, did he want a busted nose? That's what he was really just wondering. Uh, and then the guidance counselor was telling Chris that he would never be able to go to college because, you know, colleges don't want people like that. Well, Chris ended up getting a master's degree, um, so I guess he, he showed them there. But when I went home from school that day, there were a lot of people around, and they had heard about what we had done, and some of the people from the Quaker meeting were there, and, and um, there were reporters, and I'm not sure how they heard about it, but you know, people were saying, oh, you know, we think it's good what you did, you're so brave. And I was thinking, okay, I had no idea that it was going to be such a big deal, and I certainly didn't feel so brave. My father had not really wanted us to wear the armbands because it was against the rules, but my mother understood more why we did it. But we said to my father, but look, look how you stood up for what you believe in. And then he understood. It would have been the end of the whole thing, except for a group called the American Civil Liberties Union, who heard about what we had done. And there was a woman there, Louise Noun, who decided that she would get the Iowa Civil Liberties Union to help us. So it went to court. And it went to the district court, and we lost. And it went to the appeals court, and we lost. Well, of course, I thought we would lose the whole thing, because I didn't think kids could stand up you know, to the math teacher and the principal and, and all that. But, in the end, in 1969, in November, the Supreme Court ruled by 7 to 2 that yes, students do have First Amendment rights in school, and neither students or teachers leave their right to expression at the schoolhouse gate. And so it was a great victory, not just for us, but for students everywhere all over the country. And I went on, and I grew up, and I became a nurse, and I started noticing that kids really don't have rights as they should. And not only that, but our society is not set up to the benefit of children overall. I think Obama recently said that you can judge a society by the way it treats its children. And a lot of people have actually said that through history. But we don't treat our children so well in this society. Of all age groups, children are living in poverty most often. In our cities, we have something like 50% of children are graduating from high school. As it turns out, high school graduation is one of the healthiest things a teenager can do. We have 
school closings, public school closings. We have kids that are tested so that they, they don't want to go to school. We have their arts programs being cut, their music programs being cut. We have a, a situation in our schools right now that is not conducive to, to children's creativity so often and to children thriving. So Mike, he stand and I decided that we would go on a tour of the United States and encourage young people to stand up and speak up and also to hear how young people are doing that. And at the college level, you have your own issues. Um, one of the reporters for the Citrus was just reminding me, which I had heard before, that um, the university doesn't rank very well when it comes to free speech and free press. So I know you have your own issues too as far as standing up for your rights. Um, but even little elementary students need to have their rights. And so I'm really proud that we have this little coloring book that my friend and I whipped up that has to do, it's true stories of kids who have spoken up and, and stood up, used their First Amendment rights to make a difference in their own, own lives. So thank you all for having me here today. It's really good to be with you. And I hope that whatever you do in your lives, you'll also do something that will help kids to stand up for their rights. Thank you very much. Now, I think we have time for some questions. And Mike, I want you to come up and, and talk a little bit too, because Mike, for one thing, we, I met Mike because I called to congratulate him on a First Amendment award he was getting from the Society for Professional Journalists. He is a, an attorney who has spent his career helping students to use their press rights in the schools. So are you going to come up, Mike, and say a few up. words? All right. Sure. Great. Thanks. Are we sitting down? Is that the plan? Should we see this? Yeah, the mic is better, I think, here. Um, Would you like us? Yeah, let's be comfortable. All right. Mm -hmm. So anybody that asks the questions, what we're doing, at least for our, all of our high school and the middle schoolers we're talking to, we're giving them a free armband. So yeah. if you yeah, ask a question, come grab your armband. If you like. uh, <coughs> I think we have one down here. Way down here. Sorry about that. I really appreciated your talk and uh, here. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the Supreme Court uh, recently. The legacy of your case has come up in, a, in an Alaska case. And yes. I wonder what you think about the kind of speech that, like, bong hits for Jesus, if that's yes. the kind yeah. of speech you're talking about. <clears throat> Maybe you should tell about that. Does everyone know about that case? Well, there were three cases at the Supreme Court after ours that had specifically to do with student expression. I mean, there have been other cases at the Supreme Court that also had to do with the rights of children, but um, some of them had to do with the rights of children to attend integrated schools, and some cases cut back on the rights of um, children of color to attend integrated schools. But as far as strictly expression, there were three cases after ours. One was Hazelwood, which was so significant in the area of student press rights. And then one with, was Bethel versus Frazier, where a student stood up in the auditorium of his high school and gave a speech that was filled with sexual innuendos because he was running for student body president. And I, I think that's what really got his imagination going. So uh, that went to the Supreme Court also. And the Supreme Court ruled against him and also ruled against the students in the Hazelwood case. Maybe you can tell a little about the Hazelwood case, Mike. But then the Bong Hits case also was the last one that you referred to, um, where some students in Alaska, well, a student, more Joseph Frederick, he was actually a pretty, pretty interesting student. He, his free speech and rights had already been curtailed by the principal, so he was kind of ticked off about that because um, he had, well, there were a couple things that had happened, but regardless, he decided that he was going to test his First Amendment rights when the Olympic torch came to town. So the way that he was going to do it was to hold up not just a little sign, but an 18-foot-long banner that said, Bong Hits for Jesus. And he had gotten this off a snowboard, uh, he told me. I talked to him on the phone because it was all of these cases are ACLU cases, as it turns out. Our case and the three after it were all ACLU cases. And so um, 
he held up this banner saying bong hits for Jesus and his principal told him that he should take it down and he refused and so she kind of helped him take it down and then suspended him for 10 days. Well, he said he was suspended for five days, but when he started quoting Thomas Jefferson, she made it 10 days. <laughs> so um, those are the three cases. But Hazelwood was extremely significant for yeah. student journalism. Probably the most significant one of the, of the three, don't you think? Oh, I think so, yeah, yeah. definitely. And you guys are probably wondering who I am. So let me just tell you, I, my, I'm uh, an attorney with uh, the Student Press Law Center, and I've been working there for a little over 20 years. And so uh, my job at this, uh, what do we do at the Student Press Law Centers provide um, legal help to high school and college student journalists. So I've been writing about Mary's best case and talking to students, you know, for for you know over two decades. And I like to joke with Mary Beth that I think I might have told her story as many times as she has. Um, but you're right. I mean, Mary Best case that the not Mary Best case, but the Tinker case um, was uh, was pretty much the high water mark, I think, for for student speech rights um, in this country. And that in the and the court um, since that time has really just kind of got cold feet. I mean, and, and you can see that in this progression of cases. But the so there's the 1986 Bethel case um, and, the, and the kid in the student auditorium. But the one that that I've certainly been working with uh, the most is this Hazelwood case, um, and that really illustrates kind of the shift that has taken place in the at the judicial level. Um, uh, in 1988, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the basic facts, but there was a high school newspaper, uh, Hazelwood East High School, right outside of St. Louis, um, and they had a paper there called The Spectrum. Um, and as part of their coverage, they decided that they wanted to talk about contemporary teen issues. And so a couple of the issues that they wanted to talk about, uh, they decided, was uh, one, divorce, the impact that divorce had on students, uh, but also the uh, uh, teenage pregnancy. Um, I guess at Hazelwood East, they had a number of teens that were pregnant, you know, like most high schools. Um, and they said, you know, this is something we want to talk about. This is 1983, so this, that's, you know, kind of an issue that they wanted to, to cover then. So they wrote their article, um, and uh, they, it was a little bit different this time. Instead of uh, just going straight to the printer, working just with their newspaper advisor and going straight to the printer, they had actually had a change in advisor. So the new advisor required them to go to the principal first. And so the principal when he got this, he, it was really something he'd never seen in his student newspaper. Um, and he, you know, kind of freaked out. I mean, it's pretty clear in the depositions that came later. This, he, he said, you know, this was just not an appropriate topic for a high school newspaper. And so he censored it. Um, we actually got a call. I, I, I wasn't quite at the SPLC at the time, but um, we got a call at the SPLC um, from the students at, in, uh, in Hazelwood. And at the time, again, 1983, early 80s, um, the case, that the law that you would apply was the Tinker Standard. Um, and Mary Beth didn't talk about it, but the standard that the court created in Tinker, they didn't, you know, there was some, it was a 72 decision, and even on the majority, there was a, certainly a recognition that student rights aren't unlimited. They, they, it's very clear when you read the decision, they felt that student speech was an integral part of education. You know, in America, we need to teach our next generation what free speech is all about and why it's important. Um, but they also recognized um, that it was important, you know, we send students to school to educate them, and so it's really important that we maintain that educational environment. And so they said uh, that, that students would have the right to speak out and this is the tinker standard, students have the right to speak out as long as their speech wasn't unlawful, didn't intrude upon the rights of others, so as long as it wasn't you know, libelous or obscene or the things that we all, none of us have the right to do. Um, but the second category that they created specifically for um, student speech in schools uh, was they said student speech was protected unless it created a material and substantial disruption, which lower courts uh, interpreted to mean basically if the, if the speech created a serious physical disruption of school, um, then school officials could censor it. But unless it fell into one of those categories, um, you know, unlawful or disruptive, the speech was protected. So 1983, the call comes in and we read this article you know, on teenage pregnancy and divorce. And one, it's legally clean. There's nothing in the article that, that you know, violates the law, nothing libelous, nothing obscene, anything like that. And it's also not the sort of article that would create a serious physical disruption. I mean, students aren't going to freak out. They're not going to walk out of class or you know, riot in the hallways because they've read this article on, on teen pregnancy. So we said this under Tinker, under the Tinker standard, this is a very easy case. Um, we said, you know, the principal overstepped his authority. Well, the case worked its way up, and the kids actually lost at the district court level. 
Um, and we said, well, what's going on here? But when it got to the appellate level, um, the court reversed it, said, no, this is a very, again, a very easy case under Tinker. Uh, the student should be allowed to, to publish this article. Well, when it got up to the Supreme Court, and, and realize, I mean, getting into the Supreme Court, especially on an issue that for about 20 years, so from 1969 to 1987, I guess, is when the case was finally heard, um, you know, for close to 20 years, the law was really pretty settled. And the court really isn't inclined to get involved in, in controversies that are, that are settled. But they took this case. Um, and so we're like, what's going on here? Well, the court came down with a decision that um, in the very first paragraph or so, they make very clear, we're not overruling Tinker, they said. Tinker is still good law. But for we, we, we think that this is a different case from Tinker. They said that Mary Beth's case involved private speech. It was non-school <coughs> sponsored speech. The, Kate, the, the newspaper in Hazelwood was school sponsored speech. It was produced as part of a class and there was an advisor. So for school sponsored speech, we're going to create a different standard. This is a different type of speech, a different legal standard appropriate. So the standard that they came up with, and you know, I realize you know, I'm a First Amendment lawyer and I think most First Amendment lawyers, when they saw the decision the court handed down, were pretty amazed. I mean, they didn't just kind of rebalance things. They really tossed out the balance. They said, henceforth, for, for most school-sponsored expressions, students or school officials could censor it if they had a reasonable pedagogical justification. So in other words, a reasonable educational justification. Now one of the things that a lot of people don't know is the year before, the court had actually decided a prisoner speech case. What sort of rights do prisoners have in, in prison? You know, what sort of rights, do, what sort of authority do pr the wardens have to control that speech? And in that case, the language was wardens control speak and controls prisoner speech if they have a reasonable peniological justification. So when you think, I mean, it's, it's very clear, you know, it, that, that the, you know, the basis for student speech protection in America, um, you know, came right out of a prisoner rights speech. Um, so the question is, you know, the beg it begs the question, what's a reasonable educational justification? Well, the court gave some examples. And again, you know, as a First Amendment attorney, this is just not something you see in, in, in you know, most First Amendment cases. Uh, they said, and this, these are quotes, they said school officials could censor speech, so they could censor an article, if they determined that it was, quote, poorly written, if it was inappropriate, which was the language that the principal in Hazelwood had used, uh, if it was biased or prejudiced, uh, or my favorite is they said that principals, school officials, government officials could censor speech if they determined that it was, quote, inconsistent with the shared values of a civilized social order. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. I mean, this is a First Amendment sort of standard, which means, you know, Basically nothing, and so um, we've been dealing with the consequences of that ever since. So you know, in 1988, we were at the Student Press Law Center. We were getting in the neighborhood of about 500 calls for legal help a year. Uh, we are now up to, and, and it jumped up pretty quickly, but we're now up to about 2,500 calls. So I mean, you know, the the, the um, it's increased about fivefold over those over those mm. years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that's that is the big topic. Certainly at the SPLC, I mean that's where uh, I think most of the controversy we're going to see. I mean that's where a lot of the judicial, judicial action is, is taking place right now. Um, and to, frankly, courts are befuddled. Um, it's really interesting. There was uh, February of 2010, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers Pennsylvania and some of the, the mid-Atlantic mid states there, uh, they issued two decisions on the same day. Um, both of them had, and both of them were fairly similar facts. They involved MySpace cases where kids had used their MySpace page, so it's old, um, used their MySpace page uh, to, to go after the principal. They say stupid things, you know, dumb things about the principal. Um, uh, and the courts came down. These were two, three judge panels from the same Circuit Court of Appeal. They came down differently. One said students protected, that we don't believe that school officials should have kind of 24-7 authority over student speech. I mean, if a student creates a page, you know, from his home computer, um, you know, in their bedroom at midnight, you know, we think that's, that's, the, that's the place for parents to get involved. That's not really something that school officials should be involved with. In the other case, they ruled exactly the opposite way. Um, I think they, you know, there was uh, some hope, certainly, that the 
Supreme Court was going to get involved. That's where the Supreme Court needed to step in. Um, I mean, there was this confusion within the same circuit even. Um, and we're seeing there, there's a number of cases like that where courts are just, they don't know, you know exactly how much authority uh, we're going to give to kids. But that's, that's one of the messages, I think, of our Tinker Tour is that, you know, in, in you know, 1965, you know, Mary Beth wore her black armband to school because, you know, that was one of the forms of speech available. Um, when we're going to, 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 we were at the high school yesterday, you know, and I asked the question, how many of you guys have smartphones? Well, you know, basically everybody raises their hand. And one of our things is that, you know, in 1965, Mary Beth had an armband. Look at the power of the speech tools that you all have that's available to you today. I mean, you know, you, Mary Beth, in, in her case, gave you the right, but these tools just give you this power that, that if you use them effectively, if you use them, you know, in, in, a, in a responsible, uh, kind of effective manner, you can, you know, and bring about enormous change. And so we're really trying to encourage students to, um, and, and school officials. I mean, we're, it's, it's, it's funny how many school officials just, just have kind of buried their head in the sand. They don't, they don't understand the new media. Um, they're fearful of the new media. And so they don't, what we want is to teach students how to use this new media. You know, don't, we need educators to step up and to teach kids how to use it effectively because <clears throat> You're going to bring about change with this stuff if you use it the right way. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure about the, uh, what the name of the case was, but uh, there was another case uh, where there was, um, there was a day of silence at a school. I believe it was a high school. It was um, an awareness for anti-lesbian, uh, gay, bisexual, transgender bullying. And um, another student wore a shirt protesting homosexuality on his religious grounds. What do you think the challenges are and how do you think schools can respond in cases like that where it's a very polarizing issue and there's very strong voices from both sides who want to be heard and the inevitable friction that that causes? Yeah, there's, there are two cases that jump to mind. Well, the, well, there's actually a bunch of them, but two that are very... In, what, there was one in San Diego where a boy wore a shirt, I think, saying... Um, well, one said, God is ashamed of your homosexuality, and the court ruled against that, saying that that created a climate in school that was unsafe for the gay student. But then there was another case kind of similar where the kid's shirt said um, something like, gay, no, or you know, don't be gay. And that, in that case, the court ruled in favor of the student because it didn't take it to that you know, extreme of making such an unsafe climate. There's also a case in Connecticut where a boy was wearing a rainbow shirt with a slash through it, where the teacher called him up and told him he had to take off that shirt because it was against you know, gay people in the school. And basically the ACLU stepped in and, and told the school, you know, no, you can't do that. And they backed down. And the teacher was reprimanded for that. Um, in another case, Heather Gilman, this is in Florida, this girl wore, uh, started wearing rainbows on her shirt. And, and uh, the principal was a preacher also. And so he told her to take the, the uh, she had a shirt on that said something like, gay is OK, because her cousin was gay. So he told her to take that off. So all of her and her friends started wearing rainbows all over. So he banned all rainbows. Mm -hmm. No rainbows in school. And you can see this young ACLU lawyer interviewing this principal. I really kind of felt for him because it was on YouTube for a while. And she would say, well, so what's the problem with rainbows? And <clears throat> he said, well, the problem with rainbows in school is that when kids are supposed to be thinking about ma math or science or something, and they see a rainbow, they're going to start thinking about gay sex. And so she said, well, what about the reading rainbow? You know? And he said, well, I think that's a problem. <laughs> And she said, well, what about the Mac logo? I think it has a rainbow on there. And he said, well, I've got to check into that, but I think it could be a real problem, too. So anyway, um, in that case, the court, it went to court, too, and the court ruled in favor of rainbows. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, the hate speech, I think, is really a big issue um, of where does it cross the line to be d in danger. And that's something that Syracuse University is dealing with, too, and that um, FIRE, the organization for College free speech has been critical of because you know you put in these policies that are so protective. Some of these universities have policies that you cannot say anything that is sexist. 
you know, it's in your school handbook. Or something. I mean, that's just so extreme. How can you possibly do We were at a school yesterday where a girl named Phoebe Prince had been bullied on Facebook. Maybe some of you heard of that so badly that she, she committed suicide. So there are real issues, and there should be some limitations, I think. But the whole challenge is where? Where are those? I say that's the big issue right now is hate speech. Where to draw the line for bullying and still keep free speech alive? And a lot of it has to do with social media, for sure. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I feel for school officials. It's these are it, it's it's a fascinating area of law, you know, school law and student speech in schools, and it's 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 tough. Um, I, I think where where the problems arise is where there is just a, a, a knee jerk reaction, and you know, teachers or educators don't recognize some of these moments as, as real teachable moments, um, and so. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, it's some of these extreme cases that, that unfortunately seem to always make the law. Um, and it's not always the, the best law, I think, that or the best uh, kind, of, kind of result comes out of some of these things. In the back. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, but not to be uh, skeptical, uh, I think uh, encourage the children to to speak for themselves as a good thing, but uh, will people um, will suspect that the children is only the speaker of their parents or their other adults? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. will they think by themselves? Do you think that children have ideas of their own? Do you? Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I do too because I work with children and I know they have lots of, you know, ideas of their own. Uh, the school board lawyer in our case always tried to, you know, say that it was our parents that somehow made yeah, us. Some yeah, some people came, made us, that They way. made us do it or something. Which, yes, we were extremely influenced by our parents. I agree. We had ingrained, you know, their, their ideas were ingrained in us very much so. Of equality, justice, brotherhood, love. My parents had raised us like that, but I work with so many kids that have ideas, and they should be able to express them too. I think kids do have their own ideas. And actually kids are better at solving certain kinds of problems than even adults. Because as one seventh grader told me lately, we're fresher. Mm -hmm. So sometimes kids can be fresher, and they look at problems differently. You did allude to that in your speech briefly. You touched upon it about the lack of creativity in schools. Yeah. And I know that you are traveling and, and seeing different things. I don't really have a question, but I was wondering if you'd like to elaborate on that, if you see that that is um, yeah. something that uh, we are, as teachers are dealing with yeah. as well, with the great push toward the common core and these yeah. modules that are being taught and more of the push toward the state assessments. Yeah. Could you comment on that? Well, there, through history, I mean, this is kind of interesting. There have been some articles I've read about this in the, um, the American University did a law review all on the Tinker case. And one of the people that wrote, wrote an article in that uh, wrote it on um, teachers' rights. And it's usually associated with students' rights, the rights of teachers. Um, I think that was Clay Claiborne who wrote that. But, if you have a period where students' rights are being curtailed, you will usually see it's a period where teachers' rights are also being curtailed. And actually, a lot of administrators' rights are even being curtailed now. I just, uh, we, one of the principals that we were with recently, um, she signed a petition herself about the evaluation system of the teachers um, because it was so geared to test scores and things like that. Um, so yeah, creativity. I mean, you can see the most ex ridiculous examples now. I mean, I just have to collect these. Like one high school, the kids had changed, I think they had a panther for their, you know, motto or whatever it was. And so the kids had changed the t-shirts and they just put a cat paw on there. And they changed it to the, you know, cats instead or something like that on this t-shirt. So they were disciplined for changing the school, you know, animal, whatever, just on these t-shirts there. I mean, it's just really something. 
or you know, Wichita, Kansas, these kids put in their newspaper, they were, they were just dissing the athletic program, the football team, like our football team is crap, you know, it's no, they were disciplined for saying that. Uh, you could have schools now, we just were, um, when we were in Philadelphia, some teachers were telling us that their middle school kids wanted to write for their assignment, their subject they wanted to pick was gay marriage. And some other kids wanted to do it on marijuana. And they were told by the administrator they could not write on that subject. I mean, I'm a nurse. I want kids to learn about marijuana and to write about it and to be interested in the pros and cons and all the issues around, you know, surrounding all that. And gay marriage, the same thing. Um, you'll see kids, uh, there, are, there are elementary schools, which I've been to, and you have to walk to lunch like this. And you cannot talk in your lunch at all. You're not supposed to talk. Um, I mean, excuse me, that's child abuse. I don't believe, I think that's terrible. Um, and a lot of it is going on now even at the preschool level. Actually, Matt Damon's mother is an expert on preschool education, and I just heard her speak. She's been going all around the country visiting preschools. And she said it almost brought her to tears because the educational methods that are being used so often go against children's natural learning um, you know, styles and developmental age. And that they'll be uh, testing these children on whether or not they recognize the letter A, B, C, D. And they have to you know, recognize and learn. She said, that's not how children learn. They learn by drawing with chalk all different designs, and maybe they learn patterns, and maybe they experiment. You know what I mean? So I think that a lot of it has is uh, no child left behind. I'm sorry, has to accept a lot of the blame for this because of the over testing. The we just talked to a teacher in fifth. He's talking about his fourth grade child. This teacher said that his fourth grade child is brought to tears when he has to go to school, and it's test day. You know how I feel. So yeah, isn't this going on? It's going on all over the country. And I just think it's outrageous what's going on at these schools. And these schools being labeled as low performing, low performing schools, what they really should start calling the schools instead of low performing and high performing is low income and high income. Because there's a correlation of almost 100% where the so-called low performing schools you know, because, oh gosh, the kids don't get good test scores. It's all related to poverty income, um, opportunity. You know, their parents don't take the kids to the museum on the weekends because they're working two jobs because their parents are getting minimum wage and, you know, stuff like that. And kids are frustrated too. One of the yeah. things we're trying to do on this tour is, after Mary get Beth gives her awesome talk and everything, we're trying to, you know, turn the kind of turn the cameras around and hear from kids. And so uh, we were at, a, at the high school at South Hadley yesterday. I mean, uh, much of the talk, much of the hour was spent um, hearing from kids about how frustrated they are with this core curriculum, and they're being made to take, you know, three chemistry classes when they have no interest in chemistry, or and they're just they're they they're sick of it. I mean, they they were really upset about it. That was a big part of, of what we heard from them. And the materialism, the pressure to, that education yeah. is for a job. Yeah. You're supposed to get educated so you can get a job. Uh, some teachers in Garfield actually, High School, <clears throat> they last year boycotted the standardized test for the whole year. And I went to meet with them because I was in Seattle and I wanted to hear what, what it was all about. It was really interesting. And I also interviewed some of the students there at the same time to see what they felt about it. And their student council had voted 100% um, unanimous to support the teachers because they said these tests, first of all, it's taking up library time. The kids can't go in the library on so many days. They were testing the kids four or five times a year. And the teacher said, sure, we'll, we think that we should be accountable. We'll test the kids once or twice a year, but not four or five times a year. And it doesn't reflect what the students actually know or have learned. And um, so there's a real movement going on in the United States as far as education to push back on a lot of this. And it's so tied to, a lot of this stuff is also tied to school closings public school closings, where we were just in Philadelphia, they've had something like 50 schools closed, New York, 100 schools closed, Washington, D.C., where I live, 20 schools just this last summer, and students are in the streets. You can go online and see, you know, marches of students. In uh, Albany, there was just uh, thousands of people of about a month or two ago 
protesting school closings there. And um, actually, the, direct, the dean of education at Howard University just wrote a wonderful op-ed. Her name is Leslie Fenwick, about how all these school closings are basically a real estate grab in the cities where the valuable real estate is. It's really fascinating. There's so, there's so much controversy in education right now. So it's really a good time for our Tinker Tour. And we're, um, you know, just I, the idea is that, yes, these are controversial issues, but should they be talked about in school? And should students have a part in it also? Yeah, they should have some say about it, too. So as you mentioned in your um, speech, um, students, high school students, journalists, they don't enjoy the same level of freedom of speech as other protected groups. So in terms of the free speech rights, uh, where do you think it should be placed on where should the, order, the line be like, drawn? Yeah. I, I mean, love the actually, Tinker Standard. You like the Tinker Standard? <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, adults are experiencing a loss of their free speech and free press rights, too, I think, as well as students. But where should the line be drawn? I think that's the, the ruling in our case was really pretty, <coughs> excuse me, pretty reasonable that students cannot substantially disrupt school and also that they need to respect the rights of others, but that's a very gray area, too. Um, a lot of times students will be censored, and the, the um, you know, administration will say, well, you were going to intrude on the rights of others by that action. So it's, it's, kind of it's, it's just weird how controversial you know, this, this notion that we want to encourage students to speak out in school, to think about new things. I mean, that's why you're, I don't know, that's, I thought what education was supposed to be all about. I mean, that's why we send our kids to school. Certainly in a society like this, we want to, you know, we're trying to raise our next generation that, that understands what, you know, this whole system of democracy and freedom is all about. And boy, it just seems like we're doing just the opposite. We're headed in the wrong direction. Hey, thank you. Hey, anybody that doesn't have their armbands, make sure you come down and grab them, yeah? <laughs> so thank you all so much for having us here, and I'm so glad you're helping students express their rights. Thank you. Uh, before thank you leave, you. Oh, wow. you this guys are going great. to some pretty cold environments, yeah. and I'd like you to remember where you came from. Awesome. The cold Here's north. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Oh, thank man. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Oh, that's really nice. Oh, and for the bus. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And for your bus. Oh, Everybody wants to cool. see our bus. It's parked over in front of the yeah, Sheraton. You have to see. Or you can also look online at tinkertourusa.org or hashtag tinkertour and see pictures of our bus, which is all decorated for the First Amendment and students' rights. Okay. So thank you very thank much. Thank you all very much.